Okay, uh, we're going to be, Lord willing, finishing Gospel of Matthew. Tonight has been, I think, over, a little over three years. Uh, if you are interested, I have some outlines of how I, in my own outlines of Matthew, I'll you know, leave them here. Uh, if you want to come afterwards, they're just how I you know, divide Matthew into the different chapters that he's presented as the king of kings, prophet of prophets, and priest of priests. Uh, if you're interested, I'll just leave them up here. Uh, you can pick them up afterwards. I don't want to take them, you take them now while you're looking there instead of listening. <laughs> I do that every time I have a piece of paper I want to look at. Uh, Matthew 28. Uh, we have seen Jesus uh, be uh, tortured, uh, misrepresented, crucified, uh, Everybody throwing shame at him, whether it was the religious leaders, the Roman soldiers, even the criminals on the cross were uh, throwing insults at him, and uh, that didn't throw him off, of course. Uh, he knew what was happening. He voluntarily did this. He could have just wiped everybody out, but then he wouldn't have paid for our sins. So we're so, so grateful. But sometimes it's hard in everyday life to see the hand of God. Uh, to see the hand of God, really, God is involved in uh, my back pain. God is involved with the frustrations of the pressures of pain builds. Uh, the broken relationships in the families. Really, the Lord is involved in the, uh, the hard work of disciplined children, disciplining children. Really, God is involved with my neighbor who's probably addicted to drugs or you know, uh, really the Lord is involved in all my difficulties. Yes, yes, he is. But it, as we've said before, it's, it's hard to be in touch with that reality. Be in touch with the reality that God is really right here and he cares everything that I'm going through, about everything that I'm going through and that you're going through. And so we have to pause and Yes, he is, and, and exercise faith again, because, you know, <laughs> it's just tough, right? And when people do not, then sooner or later, they become desperate, aimless, bored, lost, panicked, restless, and name it, it just goes on and on because nothing, nothing, nothing satisfies the soul, our spirit, because only God can feel that, right? There's that relationship with God that only him and he alone can do that. But we try to substitute, we try to substitute so many things for God. And it's just, we have this propensity, this just automatic it doesn't feel like a choice at all, right? And by the time we know it, it's like, oh, life is such a drag. And man, nobody loves me. Or, oh, this work again. And <clears throat> we don't, we're not in touch with the fact that God is right there and he, he really does care. And he wants us to be about something that's important, that's really, really important. And when we're not about what he thinks is important, we are about what we think is important, then we lose focus again, and here we go, All right? And then we may complain, God doesn't really care. God is not really there. <laughs> because we go with what we think is important and not what he says is important. Uh, and as I said, we, we end up with all kinds of uh, experiences that are not fun. You know, loneliness, boredom, or anger, rage, uh, worrisome, worry, 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 worry all the time. In Matthew 26, I mean, Matthew 6, by way of introduction, 
<clears throat> remember this is where Jesus this is uh, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount and he preaches this sermon as the king and the king in the Old Testament and throughout was to bring absolute righteousness to the nation and Jesus is here preaching righteousness and in that righteousness you say well what's most important in life right but when we don't we you know lose focus and here we go so in Matthew 6 and verse 25 Matthew 6 verse 25 um, I'm on chapter 5 chapter 6 verse 25 for this reason I say to you do not worry do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink nor for what uh, for your body as to what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing what are you saying isn't life more than the physical things isn't life more than the physical things but that's what we worry about right am I going to make enough money am I going to have enough Am I going to, all these things that we worry about. But life is beyond the physical. And what's the non-physical part of us? Our spirit. And that's what God focuses on. But when we don't, we, we become worried. Worried, worried, worried. Um, and so he starts saying, verse 26, Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, no reap, no gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father, your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you by, wor by being worried can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. And they do not toil nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then saying what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly Seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek ye first. There it is. More, a bigger priority than all the physical needs, all the physical needs. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, or his kingdom, and his righteousness, non-physical things. His kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And we need constant reminders, right? Constant reminders that God is working in all circumstances, right? That goes far beyond the physical. But are we seeking after that? Are, are we, okay, Lord, let me be about what's important to you. I get so caught up in what I think is important. And don't you know, God, my ideas are more important than yours. <laughs> I mean, we don't say it out loud, but that's the way we do. That's the way we live. We live life. And by the time we know it, we're clawing and scratching and fighting. And here we go. Get your gloves on. <sighs> that's the reality. Right? So we have to go back and say, what motivates you in life? Me. Is it God and his kingdom? Because if not, we eventually end up desperate, aimless, bored, lost, panicked, restless, and worried, and here we go. Um, and what we find in the end of Matthew, remember, he's been presented as the king of kings, as the prophet of prophets, and as the priest of priests. He has died, risen from the dead, and now he's going to give his disciples the commandments, right? What are you going to do? Because he was going to leave, he's going to be leaving. And so this is very, very, very important for us, for all of life, for all of life. 
Does that mean we become irresponsible and okay, let me not work. Let me just kind of wait for the non-physical. No, no, no. Let's not get ridiculous. But we need to meet priority on what Jesus values. And so this is what we're going to see here. In contrast, in contrast to the paragraph before, those who refuse to do that, refuse to say Jesus has power even over death and Jesus has priorities that I need to follow, that his priorities are more important than my priorities. We don't like that. <laughs> we don't like that. Right? Um, so what we find, we're going to cover the last one, two, three, four, five verses of Matthew 28, right? Starting in verse 16. Believers are to obey the Lord Jesus to make disciples. Mm. Jesus commands us to make disciples. Do we value that? Oh, no. More involved in the church? Uh, it's right there, right? So let me read the passage. Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. But, that indicates a contrast, right? But, B-U-T, in contrast to the soldiers and the chief priests and the elders and those, the soldiers, some of the soldiers, even though they saw the hey, empty tomb and the stone being rolled away, like, <laughs> instead of believing, they went over to the religious leaders. Right, and he told them, and the religious, what did the religious leader do? They should have said, man, he said he was going to rise again from the dead. Wow, they would have bowed down, and my goodness, this is God. Oh, no. Hey, psst. we'll give you some money here. Say the disciples came and took him when you were sleeping. <laughs> How would they know if it was the disciples if they were asleep? Bing, bing, bing. Never mind. In contrast to those who refuse to believe. But the 11 disciples proceeded to, the, to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had de designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. These are the last words of Jesus in the Gospel of, of Matthew. And so usually the last words of any book are the most important ones. Right? And so here, here's the, the final appeal for the reader to decide, make a decision that he's going to trust and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we have here. Here's the final boom. Are you going to do it or not? So the disciple hadn't seen Jesus yet. They had seen him being crucified, buried. He was dead. They hadn't seen him yet. Remember, it was the women that saw him and went and told the disciples, go tell the disciples to go to Galilee, to the mountain I designate. They hadn't seen him yet. So you got to think, right? Man, their faith had been dashed. They saw him do all kinds of miracles only to be you know, crucified naked on a cross and be utterly, utterly humiliated? What happened to their faith all that time? It was just destroyed. But they went on ahead and proceeded to obey Jesus' command to go over there to the mountain. And it says here, look what it says. 
But the 11, that's what it says, right? The 11, meaning Judas, the one that had betrayed him and hung himself, he was no longer with them. Can you imagine? All that work and all those people that were following it, only 11? Can you, looking around, it's like, it's only 11 of us, guys. You had to realize, man, they had to believe. They had to have faith that this was real, right? God always calls us to have faith. Even in the midst of everything being looked so dark. To trust and obey Jesus, right? They had to have faith. They had, their faith had been dashed by the power of evil to condemn and crucify Jesus. But now the news of resurrection must have felt like the other times when Jesus had done something miraculous, like, wow, yeah. So they proceeded on to Galilee in obedience to what Jesus had commanded them. Now, what I read here it seems to be like a very private meeting. As you look at the text, it says specifically, go to Galilee. Remember, he was crucified and buried in Jerusalem. And he arose again in Jerusalem. But now go to Galilee, to the north. I want to meet you there. And then not just Galilee, but go to the mountain. It was a specific mountain that they knew that had gathered together before there. And uh, I've gone to Israel twice. And we went up to this mountain. It's probably where they were. It's kind of, kind of high and oversees the Sea of Galilee. And that's probably what. But he says, "Go to Galilee. Go to that mountain." And then he says that Jesus designated for himself. The verb there is a, a middle voice, meaning that Jesus himself. This is what he wanted. He designated this for himself. So it was kind of like a, a private meeting, so to speak, a very exclusive meeting. And you can get the sense sometimes if uh, you see meetings and you wonder, like, what are they saying? Sometimes when they're, you know, your favorite football team is playing and they go to a huddle and they're in the huddle and they're like, I wonder what they're saying. <laughs> or business meetings or whatever. Well, here there's this meeting, right? In contrast to the soldiers and the religious leaders. After he was crucified and buried, no unrighteous person would ever see him again or touch him again until he returns and they cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But never again would they see him again. Here the disciples were going to see the Lord alive again. You want to see the hand of God? You want to see the hand of, of, of God at work in front of you? Stay faithful. No matter what. You stay faithful to the Lord. Trust and obey. And he will show you his work. That's why many of us don't have a sense of the presence of the Lord. Because we're out protecting ourselves. We're out to do our own thing. And so we don't know him that well. We can pray and we can read and we can do all kinds of things. But to sacrifice and to live for him. They went. Um. This was the final appeal, as I say, in the book of Matthew. For those who were reading, will we trust and obey or not? And once they got there, it says, when they saw him, they worshipped him. And some were doubtful. Two things, of course. Those who worship him, they bow down. Literally, the word there is to bow down to the ground. In homage, in worship. I mean, here was the risen Lord who they have seen nails go through his hands and nails through his feet and a spear through his side 
and both blood and water came out. He was dead and buried. And now he was alive. I mean, he fell down to the ground. He definitely has the power over death. He has the power over death. And so they worshiped him. And then he says, but some were doubtful. You know, those that are willing to admit that sometimes they have doubt, they're actually mature. Why do I say that? Because, I mean, we're all limited. We don't see tomorrow, right? So there's going to be moments, you know, is heaven real? Is Jesus real? Because we're limited, right? It's only the mature that can say, yeah, man, sometimes I have doubts. You know, these disciples have been with Jesus. They saw him perform all the miracles and now he had risen from the dead. And it's like, that's our human nature, right? And we have to admit to that. And so some were doubtful. There's, I mean, it's a, that's one of the things that I see, man. The word of God, the Bible is definitely the word of God. Because it presents humanity in all its dimensions and all its limitations. In all its limitations, right? So, you know, some were doubtful. Uh, That did not throw Jesus off, of course. Jesus knew exactly. So he didn't throw him off. He went on and so... Now, he knew this before, but now it had been demonstrated, right? So now he says in verse 18, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, You know, in Genesis 1.1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, right? And the earth was formless and void. And then it says, God spoke. And it was so. And God spoke. And it was so. Well here is Jesus speaking. Having conquered death. And now he's going to tell his disciples. What they were to be about. And that's for you and me. Right? Here were the believers. Here were the disciples. Followers of Jesus. And he was speaking to them. Uh. And the first thing he tells them is kind of has to reassure them of who he is, right? All authority has been given to me in heaven and literally upon the whole earth. I mean, the farthest star, the farthest galaxy, the farthest everywhere. I have authority over all that. And upon the whole earth, I have the authority. Wow. Wow. That had to be an astonishing statement. Um, Jesus was, you know, had conquered Satan. There was a self-control about him because, I mean, he has all authority. He didn't have to prove anything, right? Uh, And I raised the question, well, if he has all authority, why couldn't he just zap everybody that had rejected him? Zap everybody right there and then and conquered everything. And what one followed, this is what I see. He didn't do it because, because he has chosen to use you and me to promote the gospel, to promote his name, to promote his character. Wow. He's asked me and you to be a part of that? He could have just... Wiped everybody out of his enemies right then and there. But no. Because he decided to use you and me. But again, the question comes, do we value that, right? Do we value that? Or are we so consumed by the issues of life that we lose that and then we're no longer motivated by that? We're so out of energy and so confused and doubtful and 
We don't have energy for the things of God because we lose focus. And so it was very important, the first thing that Jesus told them after he risen from the dead to his own disciples. Disciples, don't forget who is talking to you. And of course, later we find out in the Gospel of John, it's Jesus who spoke everything into being. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were created by him. And nothing that was created was without him. He is the one that created everything. And now he's telling his disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and upon earth. Don't forget who is talking to you. I am the Almighty. You see how, how important it is to get away many times of the immediate, the concerns that we have, and, and say, God, help me see what you're doing. What are your priorities, God? I get so lost on my puny, puny, puny little priorities. And then I'm all out of whack. Oh, I'm going to die. Well, hello. Because we lose focus. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Uh, I have absolute authority. It is not the United Nations. It is not China or Japan. It is not Iran or Saudi Arabia. It is not Russia, England, or the United States, or the United States of America. It is not Satan or any number of demons. It's not your employer. It's not your company. It's not your friends. It's not your spouse. It's not anyone that has all authority. It's Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Behind and above all powers and authorities stands the eternal, sovereign Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reality. And we, when we forget about that, then all other concerns become so big, so massive. And we run out of energy, right? Because we're looking to the wrong source. Jesus, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, having said that, now I'm going to give you what you should be doing. I'm going to tell you what you should be doing here on earth while I come back. And this is why it's just very, very important for believers. Because this is not, you know, the president of the United States saying this. This is not, you know, one world government. Government, No. This is the Lord of all that is. He's speaking to you and to me. He told his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is just full, full, full of meaning here. I'm just going to start blabbing here. Uh, the only uh, full verb in that verse is make disciples. The others are called participles, even though some commentaries believe that they should be uh, considered imperatives or commandments. But <laughs> why wouldn't he use the full verb? The only full verb, complete verb in that is make disciples. So we could translate it various ways. One could be, as you go, as you live life, make disciples. Or it could be a, an imperative. Go, make disciples. In a way, it's like Jesus is talking, man. Jesus is talking. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Make disciples. Share the gospel that they can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and then follow him. Right? Have them be followers and obedient to Jesus. But here Jesus mentions two things. 
baptizing them is a participle. And in verse 20, teaching them is a participle. So I gather that Jesus is saying that two main things in making disciples is first of all, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, what is that? I want you to note, baptizing them, well, baptizing, baptizo, it's an identification, right? It's an identification. The baptism of John, the baptism of soul. I'm identifying with John's teachings. I'm identifying with... Um, so baptizing is identify with. Okay, baptizing them, have them identify with what? And I want you to note, baptizing them in the name, name is singular. It doesn't say names. It says in the name. But there's three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Shouldn't it say names? No. It's singular. So what is Jesus saying? When you have somebody trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the first things, have them identify with the teachings, with the revelation, with the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity. That's what he's getting at there. Baptizing them in the name, singular, one essence. One God. Not three. One God in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The reason I say that is because every one of those has what the Greek calls uh, a definite article. He could have said in the name of a father, a son, a Holy Spirit, indefinite. No, but it has the, the, the before each one of those names. In the Greek, it's the definite article. Meaning, each and every one of those is exactly God. They have the same essence. Three distinct persons, but the same essence. Same, they're all but one God. Mysterious, right? But that's what Jesus is saying here. You're going to have them identify first and foremost with what's been revealed to you. The Holy Trinity, right? And over and over and over, he demonstrated that he himself is God. And so it's a hard concept, right? Many, it's hard for them to accept. Uh, no, it's polytheism. Three gods, poly, more than one, many. You know, that's why the Muslims, quote unquote, reject because, no, you're believing more than one God. There's only one God, right? And the Jehovah Witnesses try to, uh, no, Jesus was kind of like a God, but he was created. He's not eternal like God the Father, right? No, Jesus is saying the first thing you help them identify with the doctrine, with the revelation, with the teaching, the Christian teaching of the Holy Trinity. In the name, singular, but three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have them identify with that. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then he says, when you baptize, also teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, or to keep, to obey all that I've commanded you. He commanded them a lot, <laughs> right? What does that mean? The disciples need to go back and what did he say? What did he say? What did he teach? And that's why we need to be in the word of God. We need to be constantly learning, right? Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And behold, behold, pay attention to what I'm about to say. These are my last words. I've told you, baptize, right? Have them identify with the Holy Trinity and have them observe all that I've commanded you. But now here are my last, last, last words. I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. You know, 
Some of us may have somebody that in their presence, we like, oh, relax because, hey, man, they got my back. They know, they understand me. They might, you know, might they, legally, they'll protect me. They, financially, they'll take care of me. We can just like, oh. how about the one that has authority over all heaven and all earth? Telling you, I'll be with you always. <laughs> That's what he says at the very end, does he not? Does that move you? Does that move me? When the spouse isn't behaving, when the children aren't behaving, when the parents are not behaving, when the body is not behaving, when the boss is not behaving, when life is not behaving, am I okay that Jesus is with me? Those are Jesus' last words in the Gospel of Matthew. I think he, I don't think, I know. He knows me all too well. He knows that I'm but dust. He knows I have feet of clay. He knows that by the time I'm already on left field, man. Ruben, I know. I know you have failed. I'm with you always, Ruben. Oh. Mm. If you would just remember that. And he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Mm. So how do we apply this? What, what significance is it for you and for me? Here's the first one. Uh, be warned. Do not deny the power of Jesus, the risen Lord, over the worst problems and fears that you have. Don't deny Jesus' power, man. If we deny Jesus' power, you will give in into the world's ways of using money, lying, covering up, or depending on some group power politics. Is that not what happened here contextually? The soldiers refused to embrace the power of Jesus over death. And the religious leaders refused to embrace the power of Jesus over death. And what did they do? Money. Lying. Say the disciples came. And politics. We'll win the governor over if he gets to him. Isn't that the world system, right? And we can be manipulative. I'll throw a little money here to hide that. I'll save this little thing in manipulation. And I'll talk to the people that are important. I'll, I'll win them over. I'll gain, gain their favor. That's what happens when we deny the power of Jesus over any problem that we're facing. I mean, what's the biggest problem that we have? We stop breathing, right? Got any bigger problem than that? <laughs> and Jesus has the power over death. Jesus rose again from the dead. And so we say, warning, don't deny the power of Jesus. Otherwise, you end up living just like the world and you don't even know what will happen the world's ways only lead to shame and death but if we say well you know what I am afraid I am afraid you know what that takes that takes humility that takes being humble to say I, I, uh, Lord I need you know, that's actually being a human being. That's being a man. That's being a real woman. To say, I, I, I need help. Right? We're, we're creatures. We're not infinite. 
We're creatures. And that's automatically means that we're dependent beings. And so the more we acknowledge how dependent we are, the more human we become. Right? But it takes, it takes humbling. It takes humility to, to accept that. But we're not going to do that, right? We're not going to do that unless the Holy Spirit is with us. And we get the Holy Spirit by trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior. Right? Over and over. The scriptures say that. So the first and foremost is like, we need to trust Jesus as our Savior. Uh, acknowledge that we're sinners, that we deserve judgment, but that Jesus paid for all of our sins. All of our sins. All of our sins. And trusting that he actually did that, the Bible says we belong to God when we put faith in Jesus in that way. So that's application number one. Don't deny the power of Jesus. Uh, here's the second one. Keep obeying Jesus in making disciples, right? We need to, then we raise the question, well, what's keeping you from making disciples? What's keeping me from making disciples? Sometimes we have to identify, well, what is it? Because ultimately, they're just excuses. Oh, I got too much work. Oh, I got too many bills. Oh, I don't have time. Ugh. No, no. Those are just excuses, brothers and sisters. We need to obey Jesus in making disciples. You might say, well, I don't know the Bible. You don't need to know the whole Bible. Do you know Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again from the dead? There's not much to memorize there. And that's where you can start. Do you know the Bible is the word of God? You can tell people, hey, you need the Bible. Do you know that God created the church and we're to be a part of the church? You can tell that to the disciples. You see how much you know? You know a lot already. And then to be in the Word so that we can be teaching others. It might be a three-year-old, five-year-old, ten-year-old. Or some neighbor or somebody that you can start discipling. But what keeps you from making disciples? Because that's Jesus' command. That's Jesus' command, right? And did you know that that's what gives meaning to our life? When we obey what Jesus has commanded, that's what we're on earth for. If we don't obey Jesus in making disciples, we're lost, man. We think we have purpose in life, but there's nothing. It might take 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 years, 60 years to finally realize, man, life is empty. I've got nothing to live for. Oh? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I am the creator, and I'm telling you what to do. This is the greatest purpose you can have in life. Obey me and you will have unbelievable motivation and purpose in living. And what is the command here? Make disciples. Make disciples. What's keeping you? What's keeping me? That's why we end up in all kinds of fights and emotional troubles. Because we're not living according to the purpose why we're living here on earth for, right? So, make disciples. That's what Jesus says. Application number three. I have four applications this time. <laughs> you see, I have three. Application number three. Commit to a lifetime of learning about Jesus. About Jesus' word, right? Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Well, if you don't know what he commanded... Stick your nose in the Bible. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me understand. Right? So commit yourself. That I need to be studying the word of God so that when I disciple, I have something to say. And there's bukus and bukus and bukus of help. Oh, my goodness. Our website alone livingwordefc.org has over 500 of my sermons. Not that they're all that great, but it's something. 
Over 500 sermons. You want to go there and say, what sermons are there? Well, let me read the passage first. Read that passage one, two, three, four times, ask questions, and then listen to the sermon. <laughs> That's just one website, man. Oh, my goodness. There's books. There's oh, the best preachers in all the world are there on the Internet. I mean, I don't know how many translations there are. There are hundreds of translations. Plenty of resources. But commit to a lifetime of learning about Jesus' word. That's application number three. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Right? Finally, my last application is this. We are to make Jesus Lord of our lives. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Maybe you've trusted him for salvation. Right? And that's the foundation. But now to say, is he Lord of my life? Or am I Lord over myself? Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm an American, don't you know? <laughs> no, Jesus needs to be Lord. Not my will, Lord, yours be done. But it's a decision that we all need to make. He will be Lord over my life. Otherwise, you're saying, no, Lord, I will not. How's that working out? So it's a decision that we all mean, no, I need to make Jesus the Lord over my life. Submit to his word, for he has all authority. Um, and that means, okay, he is Lord. I'm going to commit to making disciples because that's what he said we ought to be doing. And when you make disciples, it's, you no, know, I mean, Jesus taught on finances. Is Jesus Lord over your finances? How about your behavior? Are you watching things you're not supposed to be watching? Using language you're not, that's dishonoring to God? Are you treating others with respect and loving them? Do you tell lies? Are you worshiping Jesus? Why not? Why not? Right? If he is Lord, we bow down and worship him. Verse 17. Even though at times we may have doubts, um, Jesus conquered death and commands us to make disciples. We, will we submit to his lordship or not? That's the end of the Gospel of Matthew. If you'll remember, he's presented as the King of Kings, Prophet of Prophets. And priests of priests. So let my life be.